So make sure you invite someone to be with you on Easter Sunday morning here at Liberty, whether you're going to be here at our Highway 76 campus or with our Fort Oglethorpe campus. And we want to welcome you guys in at Fort Oglethorpe this morning as we are at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and we're continuing in this series called Wasted, making sure that we avoid eternal wastes of time. And this morning, we are talking about the danger of an eternal waste of truth. 1 Timothy is one of three letters inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, written to pastors to instruct them on how to care for themselves and also for their congregation so that they do not fall into sin or into doctrinal error. And these letters bring up several things along the way to which we need to give very careful attention. And he begins to bring up another one of these issues in verse 6 of chapter 4. He says, if you put these things before the brothers, the brothers refers to not just the men in the congregation, but to everyone that's in the congregation. He says, this is something, pastor, that you need to talk about with the church. This is not a problem outside. This is going to be a problem inside, and you would do well to address it. You would be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of good doctrine that you have followed. And then he says, here's something, something that we need to talk about. He begins with the words, have nothing to do with. Now, let's stop the sentence right there. Have nothing to do with. Now, if, if we were to imagine how, as a church, we might fill in the blank of things that the Bible tells the church we are to have nothing to do with, we would fill in the blank with maybe something like adultery. That is, that is bad for the church. That is something we should have nothing to do with. Sexual sin is dangerous for the people of God. We would say we should have nothing to do with embezzling money, with greed, with mismanagement. Whenever churches squander resources and deceive people, that is not a good look. For the people of God. Have nothing to do with. We would put any one of the Ten Commandments in that line right there. Have nothing to do with these things. What else could we put into that category? What is it possibly that he is going to say that is so dangerous for the people of God that we need to have nothing to do with it? Notice what the Word of God says. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Myths? What's a myth? A myth is a fanciful, made-up story that has elements of truth to it. It, It takes historical realities or realities of the day, and it creates a narrative around it. Now, in Timothy's day, it looks like the myths that they were dealing with were some sort of retelling of biblical accounts or biblical stories. You see, if you read in First uh, Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, he indicates that some of the, the deceptive teaching that's going on has led to people having their consciences seared, and they are forbidding marriage and requiring abstinence from food that God created. Now, I don't think this is a big issue for us. I'll tell you, this is not at all an issue for me because yesterday I had fried chicken with my wife. So I am not falling into that deceptive doctrine. I would affirm food and I would affirm marriage. But, but nevertheless, he says that you need to be careful with these myths. And here's the thing about First and Second Timothy and Titus. He talks about the danger of these myths more than any other danger for the church. He opens up First Timothy chapter 1 telling him, Listen, man, don't make sure that you don't fall into myths and these vain discussions. He says, be careful. And I would call it the sin of the church becoming pointless. 
that we are constantly talking and arguing about things that absolutely don't matter in the end. And this, this danger of becoming pointless is so important for them to pay attention to that Paul actually ends the Timothy letters by talking about a time in which there would come an information bias in which people would seek out authorities to validate anything that they want to believe. 1 Timothy chapter 4, the, the, it says this, for the time, or the 2 Timothy 4 says, The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. That's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. He says, Timothy, you need to be careful that you and your church doesn't wander off into fanciful fables that are very enticing and believable because they have elements of truth to them. So Paul says, Timothy, please tell your people, have nothing to do with myths. Now, we don't call them myths in our era, and we don't have problems with mythical retellings of Old Testament stories, but we do live in an era of fables nonetheless. Fables in which people are taking elements of truth and current events and circulating them heavily as they add to them fabricated lies. We, we are in an era of conspiracy theory. And they've run rampant, not just in our culture, but conspiracy theories are running rampant inside the church. Like many of you, on the day of the Capitol riots, I was sitting there and I was watching television, like many of you, watching all of this unfold. And I had my Twitter account and I had my Facebook account all open, wondering how people were responding to what was going on. And while I was watching that, I was watching people that, that I have had relationships with in former churches and in this church is propagate three different theories immediately of what we were seeing unfold. One was, it wasn't really happening. That, that wasn't a reality. Even though I was looking on television, I was seeing thousands of people on Capitol Hill, that wasn't actually taking place. That was theory number one. Theory number two was, it was Antifa dressed up like Trump supporters and then theory number three was the entire thing was staged. That there were a group of people that were in town for the rally. They were taken on a tour inside the Capitol and they were attacked by Capitol Police. And so the whole thing was instigated so that it would turn into what you were seeing. Those three theories, I can tell you one thing about all three of them. No way all three of those things are true at the same time. But yet the people of God were the ones propagating these things. And if you trace the root of all three of those theories, that all three of them are rooted in people who get on social media and propagate conspiracy theories. Lifeway released a study not too long ago that reported that 49% of U.S. Protestant pastors say they frequently hear members of their congregation repeating conspiracy theories. What's interesting about that is pastors of churches of more than 250 are 61% agreeable with that statement. It means they are more likely, the larger the church is, to hear those conspiracy theories propagating in their congregation. I 100% agree that it is people within the church that are prone to fall into these conspiracy theories and fan the flames of these things going on. That's why the Holy Spirit moved Timothy to say, you would do well if you would tell your people, stay away from myths. 
Timothy, you need to talk about this. You need to address this. And so we are today because it is in the Word of God. And so what I want to do today is to persuade you to be careful in in our current age of political myth-making because here's the thing. It's an eternal waste of truth that we need to avoid we, we need to be people who are devoted and spending our time and energy and passion doing what the Word of God tells us to do, and that is to preach the gospel and make disciples. And in order to be effective at that, we need to be people of truth. And so this morning as we walk through the passage, I want to show you why we should have nothing to do with conspiracy theories. And I give you three reasons. The first reason is because conspiracy theories are misleading truths. They are misleading truths. I think a good question for us to ask at this point is, why is it that the people of God are prone to fall into these conspiracy theories? I I think there's several reasons. One of the reasons conspiracy theories have found traction in our culture is not really a problem with the church, but it's a It's a problem with our culture at large. And it's the bias of the media. And I think that we all observe that the media has an incredible agenda of selecting stories and then also a selective way in which those stories should be covered. If you don't believe me, just look at the recent coverage of the Governor Cuomo scandal and all the things that are going on with that. It is obvious to see a latent media bias. And the media is to blame for this. Because if you want to crush conspiracy theories, people need to have trusted, truthful sources of information. And people don't feel like they have that right now. And so what they do is they search for truth. And then the people of God added to that, the Scriptures tell us that in latter times, there's going to be deception. So we're already suspect of the world and its systems and all the things that are in front of us. And then there's the human curiosity. We want to be in the know. We want to know what's going on. Think about even when the apostles are sitting there with Jesus and they're at the temple and Jesus says, I tell you what, one of these days, man, there's going to come a day when there won't be one stone in this structure that's not thrown down. Not one stone will be left among And remember what their question was, Lord, tell us, when will these things take place and how will they be? We want to be in the know. And then Jesus gave them the answer that anyone in the know doesn't want to hear. You're not going to know all of it. (laughs) He just tells them, I'm not going to tell you the whole thing. He says, but I'm going to tell you enough of what you need to know so that you can be aware of the times and the seasons. I'm not going to give you all the information. I'm going to give you enough information that you can do two things. One, not be deceived. And two, go about the mission of spreading the gospel and making disciples. But human curiosity overrides. We want to know. We, We want to feel like we're on the inside. And it's really enticing whenever we feel like we know something that other people don't know. And so this makes us very susceptible to misleading truths, which is why early on in COVID, I was on the phone with people in our congregation who were symptomatic but were afraid to get tested because they believed that the government might be putting computer chips in their brains. People really did believe that was happening. And I was on the phone having to counsel people through this. This is why this human curiosity is why a preacher can make a video about insider information that he has or dreams that he has. And and we all share it and we love it because we feel like we're getting something that puts us in the know. It helps us to know what's going on. This human curiosity and the misguided nature of it is the reason people believe that the Oval Office is a Hollywood movie set, which is why they believe that Biden is not really the president, that Trump's inauguration day keeps getting delayed more and more, but it's coming soon. 
This is why people believe that the power grid is going to fail, that we're about to go into martial law, that Italy is in a conspiracy to undermine our elections, that the Pope is a hologram, and that Hillary Clinton is running a child sex trafficking ring in the basement of a pizza place that has no basement. All of these things are popular stories that are being propagated on social media, and many of the people of God are the ones who are propagating these stories. Conspiracy theories are enticing because they fill in the blanks of, of, of missing information, and they promise to connect the dots of a world that we are seeking to try to understand. And they take advantage of our distrust as they tell us they're about to uncover the cover-up, and we want to know. And there's going to be people who watch this video right here, right now, and will say, he's in on it. He's in on it. And they'll reject it. But notice that the Word of God says, Pastor Timothy, you need to talk about this. Because they're irreverent, silly myths. Now, notice the words he uses to describe them. Irreverent and silly. Let's, let's go backwards through that. The word silly literally means of old women. I, you're like, you got to be kidding me. Look up the Greek. That's really what it means. We, we would call this in our culture old wives' tales. And it's a derogatory term to women of that culture because they were mainly uneducated and uninformed, so they were prone to take the world and spin it into a crazy story. Now, we're not addressing what it says about women as much as what it talks about the, the nature. They're crazy. They're uneducated. They're uninformed. Stories like the Pope is a hologram. Nancy Pelosi's in prison. The Oval Office is a movie set. Those sorts of things are silly. They, they don't have substance to them. And then there's the word irreverent. That word irreverent is literally the word profane. It means it's no good. Profane meat is, man, the, the, if you go into a butcher shop and they've got those really nice select cuts of meat that are worth the purchase, that are worth cooking, and are worth eating. And then there's the parts that are profane. They don't sell them. You don't cook them. No way you would eat them. They're only destined for the trash. That's irreverent. Everybody here at our Highway 76 would really understand this. Irreverent is when you make a run of carpet and it's flawed and you don't sell it, you reject it, and you cut it up into little pieces so that people buy it as, like, like wipe off mats in their camper. That's what irreverent is. It's really good for nothing. It's a scrap. Get rid of it. That's the word irreverent. It's just enough to clean off your shoes. That's about it. And look at all the speculations of conspiracy that we've heard over the past 18 months. And I want to ask you this question What was any of it worth? I don't know if you realize this, but Trump was supposed to get inaugurated again yesterday. And he didn't. So all the time, effort, and energy on propagating that story, here's my question. What's it worth? Nothing. And so here's the real problem. Your Savior told you there would be things in this world that you would never know. That you'll never understand. All the blanks will never be filled in. But you have enough information to not be deceived and to do what we're told to do, spread the gospel and make disciples in a lost and dying world. Conspiracy theories are misleading truths, and we need to be concentrated on the eternal truth of the Word of God. Conspiracy theories are dangerous because they are mismanaged time. 
Notice he says, rather, train yourself for godliness. Now, he's going to use words from athletics. That word train is literally the word uh, that we take the word gymnasium from. And then he says in verse 8, he's going to compare a value. While bodily training is of some value. So he's got the picture of an athlete. Man, this guy's dedicated. He's repetitive. He's disciplined in his approach. He says it, it, it does change him. He says, but godliness is of a value in every way. Godliness is of so much more value than the training you see of a great athlete in a gym. We ought to be training in the Word of God even more so than you see an athlete training in the gym. We ought to have an even better approach. Because godliness is of value in every way as holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And then skip down to verse 10. He says, for to this end we toil and strive. I want to say this to you. If you think that godliness is easy, that Bible study is no problem, that devotions are nothing to you, you're probably doing it the wrong way. It ought to make you sweat a little. <laughs> it, it ought to be a little inconvenient. It ought to take up a lot of time. There ought to be a real discipline to your approach to this. There ought to be some struggle in it as you are afflicted by the Word of God and there's a resistance in your flesh to change. If, if you don't feel that, you're not working at it hard enough. The same thing that a trainer would tell an athlete, if you come in here and you lift weights, it's too easy, you need to get some bigger ones. You need to go heavier. There needs to be more of a strain in this. There needs to be some rigor, a toil, and a strive. One of the dangerous things about conspiracy theories is that they are a waste of time. Conspiracy theories take an extreme amount of time. They, there's people propagating these things and sharing them and talking about them and discussing them. And even if it's not just time on social media, there's the bandwidth of your time and your brain concentrating on them the rest of the day. Because here's what people do when they get caught up in this stuff. They constantly watch the news, waiting to see what they believe is about to happen, happen. And then all of a sudden, everybody will know. And so it's just this constant watching, wanting the cameras to catch it in the moment when it all comes. And your whole day is consumed with this. All your thoughts and decisions are, are filtered through this information. It takes a lot of time to be caught up in a conspiracy theory. Christianity Today released an article in July that said, now catch this, during the early days of COVID, when a lot of people were in quarantine, Bible reading went to an all-time, and what do you think the next word I'm about to say is? You, we ought to said it went to an all-time high, but while we were in quarantine, Bible reading went to an all-time low. When we had more time to be in the Word of God than we ever had before, we were spending most of that time trying to prove that COVID was a hoax. That it wasn't real. That it was a conspiracy. Our time in quarantine would have been much better spent working in the Word of God on our godliness. That would have been of supreme value. That should have been a time of extremely disciplined approach to the Word of God. Conspiracy theories are dangerous because they are mismanaged time. Number three, conspiracy theories are dangerous because they are misplaced trust. We should have nothing to do with them because they lead us to trust the wrong thing. One of the reasons that conspiracy theories are enticing is because they make you feel heroic. They, they make you feel like that if you're in on it and you help with it, then you're some sort of person who's making a difference in this new revolution. You're going to bring about a real change that's going to benefit everyone. And you're a hero for doing that. That's what a conspiracy theory makes you feel like. So I want to pose this question to you this morning. 
Let's imagine that at 3 o'clock this afternoon, Fox News comes on and tells us it has been proven without a shadow of a doubt that Italy rigged our elections. There's a flicker in the hologram that is the Pope, and all of a sudden he disappears. And we realize it, he really was a hologram. Let, let's imagine that by 4.30 we really realize the Oval Office was actually a Hollywood movie set. That is proven true. Well, let's go deeper. Let's, let's imagine that Biden's really in jail. The person you see is only an actor. And all of a sudden, we also realize that by 6.30 that the earth is flat. It's all proven true. Right magically within about three hours this afternoon, it all happens. Let me ask you this question. As the revolution begins and a lot of people die without ever hearing the gospel, what happens to them? If it's all proven true and a lot of people lose their lives tonight, do they go to hell satisfied that they were right? Or do they go to hell heartbroken because they realized the whole thing was an eternal waste of time? I think the latter is what the Bible teaches. Notice that verses 9 and 10 of chapter 4 say this is worthy of full acceptance. And buddy, that's a quite a standard, full acceptance. We have to be real careful with that. And notice that verse 10 says, For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior for all people. He's died for them all. But notice... What makes the transaction active is especially of those who believe. In order to be saved, the gospel must be believed. And I want to tell you this. We don't convey that the gospel needs to be believed if we propagate two things. One, that QAnon is our Savior and the source of our truth. And, and it's not. The Bible is the source of our truth. Jesus is our Savior. He is the one who is going to bring about the righteous revolution of all things. But second of all, I want you to think about how conspiracy theories undermine what we are supposed to constantly preach. Now think about this. If you go around and you tell people, that Trump was going to be inaugurated in January, that Trump was going to be inaugurated, I think it was on March the 4th, that Trump was going to be inaugurated on March the 20th, and it, it keeps not happening. And then you go tell people that Jesus is the Son of God who is going to return again to judge the world. Notice how Something that is not happening undermines something that is going to happen. And here's what happens in conspiracy theories. And I, I want everybody in this room to, to take this with a tremendous amount of grace. No one, no one likes to find out they've been deceived. Nobody does. And, and I want to tell you, if you're sitting here right now or you're watching this and you realize, man, I have given myself and a lot of time and effort to something that means nothing. You, there is a sense in that in which you're, you're embarrassed. You're like, I can't believe this. So, so I, I want to, to say this with absolute utmost sensitivity. We need to be careful with these things and repent of our involvement with them and ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us to give us truth and clarity that we would, be, we would have nothing to do with silly myths. And that He would help restore us to a place that we would actually be propagating the truth, which is what people need to hear. And I want to tell you this. People will need recovery from conspiracy theories just like people need recovery from a drug addiction. Because it's addictive. It's a mental addiction. It's a, a spiritual addiction. And you need to understand this. The QAnon thing is almost like a cult of its own. 
It, it's its own way of salvation. It's its own way of all these different things. And it's dangerous. And we need to be careful with this. And so Paul tells Timothy, he says, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. Being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine you have followed, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. We are to be a people who preach an eternal truth that Jesus is the Son of God. That He is the only one who can save us from our sins. He is the one who is in control of the end. And we need to be pointing people to an eternal kingdom that is revealed to us in the Word of God. For in this is salvation, and there is no other. So I want to ask you, whatever campus you're at this morning, to bow your head and close your eyes with me for a moment. Jeff's going to come help us at Fort O. Linda's going to come help us here at Highway 76. I want to open these altars up this morning. And man, this is, a, this is a strange kind of an invitation because we're real sensitive in this moment. And so I want to put it out there like this. Number one, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you come and we'll take the Word of God and show you the eternal truth. Please come. Be saved today. Repent of sin. Turn to Jesus as your Savior. If you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Pastor, man, I want to pray for my country because there's a, it's a big old mess. And I want to tell you the, the cool thing that I see happening right now is that in this big old mess, man, we are becoming more and more ripe for revival. For people to realize the error and the deception that, the, that demons and Satan is sowing into this world and and that we can find the truth in the Word of God. So you come this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you're up, Brian, I've heard this and I'm so heartbroken over it. I, I don't believe anything anymore. And see, that's the real deception and confusion of a conspiracy theory is that a person comes to believe there is no truth. So we need to be careful. So maybe you're here this morning and say, man, I just want to come and ask the Lord to repair my heart, to help me to recover, to get back to the truth. Maybe you want to come this morning and pray for your boldness to preach the gospel, to make disciples. Maybe there's family things going on that you want to pray about. Maybe there's different needs all together, and you want to come and lay them in the altar before the Lord. But I want to pray for you, and then we're going to stand together and respond to what the Lord's telling us to do. Heavenly Father God, we come before you, obeying the Word of God to put before your people that the Word of God and our time and attention and training is in it is of an eternal, godly value. And so, Lord, we pray that you help us to not be deceived, to turn away into conspiracy theories and to propagate things that are not true and are just completely distracting. But, Lord, help us to be about the business of the gospel. And, Lord, we pray for our country that, Lord, you would bring about a revival as we constantly turn away from truth. Lord Jesus, use your people to rise up and preach the gospel. Bring us mercy. Bring us revival. Bring us boldness. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?